Well, good morning. It's such a delight uh, to be with you uh, today and to be able to study uh, Scripture together. Um, we have such uh, wonderful and exciting passages of Scripture to look over. We're going back to the beginning of Scripture, going back to the book of Genesis. Uh, we're going to uh, learn to pray with our fathers in faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and try to derive some principles of prayer uh, from these great heroes, from these great men who uh, endured suffering and loneliness and spiritual perseverance and fought the good fight in their own age, and they set, they set a great example for us uh, in our time. So let's begin with an invocation of the Father. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send down upon us your Holy Spirit now to uh, prepare our hearts uh, to receive the seed of the word so that it may go into uh, the good soil of our heart and there uh, sprout and grow and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're calling this talk, uh, Calling on the Father with the Fathers. Okay? Learning prayer from the patriarchs. And one thing I want to address from the outset is, um, can we really say that the patriarchs called on God the Father? Because as Dr. Hahn uh, pointed out last night, um, it's very rare in the Old Testament to refer to God as Father. It's rare in Judaism. And this is really something that our Lord taught us to do as our Lord invited us into the relationship of a son to a father that he himself enjoyed. So is it appropriate to speak of the patriarchs as calling on God the Father? And I think in a sense it is because... Um, the fatherhood of God, while, some, while being something that's fully revealed only in Christ, is implied from the very beginning of the Bible. Um, we all remember that in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, it speaks of, God, of man, of Adam, being made in the image and likeness of God. And of course, uh, philosophers and theologians have debated through the centuries, what does image and likeness mean? And many things have been proposed, and, and many true things have been said about that. But the Bible itself offers us some insight into the meaning of image and likeness when we go to Genesis 5, 3, and there we read a little bit later in salvation history that Adam had a son, Seth, and Seth, his son, was born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. And that's a very important, what we call, intertextual clue for understanding the significance of image and likeness. It implies, then, that Adam was uh, created um, uh, in a role, in a relationship of son to a father. Okay, That God, therefore, is the father of humanity. And uh, that, is, that is through what we often call the Adamic or creation covenant, which um, Dr. Hahn uh, also spoke of last night that a, a covenant is present in the very beginning of creation in which uh, mankind enjoys the relationship of a son to a father, of children to a parent. And uh, so, well, again, while it's not explicit until we get to Jesus, um, I think we can say that uh, the great fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they called on God the Father, even though the full nature of God uh, was yet to be revealed to them. Um, the first thing I want to point out when we look into the book of Genesis and examine Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, the first thing I want to examine about their pattern of prayer was that they set a paternal example. Okay? I've got these fill-in-the-blank outlines. I used to do, uh, learn to do this uh, because I make my living uh, teaching 18 to 22-year-olds. Um, often at inconvenient times of the day, like this one, uh, rather early in the morning. And um, I found that if I don't give them any outline, they, they sit there with uh, blank expressions, uh, trying, I think they're trying in goodwill, to 
listen to everything I say, but if I provide them everything on the outline, they just look at, oh, I can read this at home. <laughs> Time to catch that nap. So, got to put a few blanks there. <laughs> so, they, they have to stay awake to, what was that fill in again? <laughs> okay, so that first fill in there is a paternal, paternal example. The patriarchs led in prayer and worship. Okay? In fact, as we're going to look at in a moment, they performed all the duties of the priests. So this is just a very basic observation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were fathers who prayed. Okay? Unlike some modern Catholic men, okay, Abraham didn't stand outside smoking a cigarette while Sarah was in the tent watching Melchizedek offer a sacrifice. Okay? And Jacob didn't wake up on Saturday morning and tell Rachel and Leah, hey, pack up the 12 kids on camels and take them to the synagogue. I'm going to catch a nap on my day off. Okay? This is not the kind of example the patriarchs set. These were men of prayer. Now, Ishmael and Esau probably were like those guys. Okay? But, uh, but that's why the covenant doesn't run through those guys. The covenant runs through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because these were men of prayer. And as Dr. Hahn pointed out last night, prayer and the covenant are so intimately related to one another. You need to pray uh, to stay in the covenant. And uh, so let's take a look at some of the examples of how these fathers prayed and Uh, In fact, how they performed the other duties of the priesthood. For example, one of the duties of a priest is to bless. And we see the patriarchs blessing uh, their children in particular, their sons in particular. One example, Genesis 28.1, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, said, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you. And of course, there's many other examples. Famously, Genesis ends with Jacob pronouncing a blessing on all 12 uh, tribes. So the whole book has a culmination with a fatherly blessing, but that's also a priestly blessing because in these early times of salvation history, the, the father was the priest. Again, offering sacrifice. Uh, perhaps the most famous sacrifice in Genesis is Genesis 22. Uh, We call that the Akedah, or the binding of Isaac, or sometimes we call it the sacrifice of Isaac, although Isaac uh, did not uh, eventually end up being sacrificed at this event because of the ram in the thicket. But um, we know the story, how Abraham was commanded to take Isaac to the top of the mountain to offer him there to God. And uh, we recall that Abraham is very old at this time, over 100 years old, and Isaac is a strapping young man who's strong enough to carry a big load of logs um, up, uh, up Mount Moriah, which, is, uh, which in Jewish tradition is identified as the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is a steep climb, by the way, if you've been there. So Isaac is a strapping young man carrying these logs up for the sacrifice. And uh, the, the obvious conclusion that we draw from that, uh, that the rabbis already drew in antiquity, is that uh, Isaac could have overpowered his aging father, okay, his 110-year-old father, um, who is probably having a difficult time even climbing up to the top of the mountain. And uh, the implication then is Isaac must have been a willing party to this sacrifice because there was no way for his um, elderly father to overpower him and force him onto the altar. And so this is a great uh, cooperative sacrifice, a sacrifice that Isaac freely accepted um, at the top of, uh, of the Temple Mount, uh, so close to uh, Calvary. It is the great um, type or image of Calvary in the Old Testament. But in this uh, great event in Genesis 22, we see Abraham performing the duties of a priest. So he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram, offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so we see Abraham performing the priestly role in this very important event, um, and also building offers and altering, offering sacrifice in other parts of Genesis as well, as we see in our next point, um, just the general leadership and worship. 
Back in Genesis 12, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, which is a, uh, a priestly duty to build and maintain a sanctuary who had appeared to him. And he called on the name of the Lord, which uh, means prayer, as we're going to see in a moment, and also worship in general. We might say liturgical prayer, which would involve uh, sacrifice. So there's good reason why we call priests father. Uh, in fact, um, the identification of a priest as a father occurs already in this first book of the Bible. In Genesis 45, 8, Joseph is uh, talking to his family, and he says that God has made me a father to Pharaoh. By that, he means that Pharaoh had instituted Joseph uh, in the role of priest, and he was performing a priestly role for the king of Egypt. So uh, the, a father is a priest, and a priest is a father. And that's been part of Catholic piety down through the generations. For, for ages, we've understood that the father is the priest of what we call the ecclesia domestica, the, the, uh, the home church, the domestic church, Okay. And therefore, it, it's incumbent upon the Father to lead in worship and to lead in prayer, to set the example of prayer for his uh, wife and children. This is, this is the primary expression of, um, of, the, uh, of the headship that um, St. Paul speaks of when he calls the husband the head of the wife in Ephesians 5. What does it mean for the husband to be head of the wife? Does that mean, you know, husbands come home, wife, get me a steak, had a long day, you know? Is that, you know, is this coming some kind of secular boss mentality? Is that what St. Paul means by calling the No, okay? That is a priestly role. That is a, a spiritual role, a sanctifying role. Not, not one of um, command, but one of service. And, and the mode of that service is primarily spiritual. It is to set an example and to, to set a leadership in the area of, of worship and of prayer, to set that tone, because the tone in the family is set by the father. The father's attitude uh, controls the, um, the atmosphere uh, in the family home. So husbands are called to, to perform that priestly role of service within the family. Uh, in my own experience, you know, I first um, encountered this concept, uh, I, actually ironically, Back when my wife and I, uh, my wife now of uh, 21 years, uh, when we were courting and then we were engaged and we were taking marriage preparation, and some of you know, uh, know a little bit about my story, but um, uh, one of the pieces of the, of the path that led uh, into the Catholic Church for me was um, a Catholic teaching on... Uh, uh, openness to life, because when I was engaged um, to Dawn, uh, I went to my mom, uh, who I greatly respect in these matters, and I asked her what, sh what her opinion was about uh, birth control and uh, the regulation of parenthood, etc. And my mom said, um, basically, no Protestants have the right idea about these things. You should go get marriage preparation from a Catholic church. <laughs> That's a, that was my mom, okay? My my beloved Dutch Calvinist mother, who is still a Dutch Calvinist, um, uh, God bless her, a uh, woman of prayer, said, go, go get training from a Catholic church. So I had a very high view of, of what we call um, uh, the grace of state. Okay, I didn't have that terminology back then, but that's what it was. It's Basically, that means, you know, your parents have grace of state. I mean, that despite their sins, God can use your parents to speak to you because he's placed them in authority over you. And I have a very high view of that. So I thought, well, you know, if this was, if this was what God is saying through my mom, that's what I'm going to do. So um, uh, I went down to the uh, Catholic Information Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And sure enough, they had a, uh, they had a brochure there about, uh, it was full of you know, acronyms, NFP by CCL, you know, like ABC and CIA, you know, LMNOP, you know, okay, I got to cross my T's and dot my I's here, and um, so it was in Our Lady of the Immaculate Assumption or something church, uh, 
north of Grand Rapids, and um, so we signed up, my wife and I, and, uh, and enrolled in these classes uh, to, with the Couple to Couple League, which I'm sure many of you uh, know about, probably many of you here uh, support or members, and my wife and I are, we've been uh, lifelong members, uh, even as Protestants, we were uh, part of the CCL organization. And uh, so we, we had these classes, but, uh, and I could, uh, you know, tell some interesting stories about being a Protestant in an NFP class, but uh, I'll spare that because we still got to keep our focus here. But um, they had these books out during, during the classes that you could purchase afterwards, and one of them was, um, uh, I don't remember the exact title, but it was written by a priest, and it was something to the effect of Father Priest of the Home, and it was an old book. Um, you know, probably uh, published um, back in the 60s or just before the uh, council and um, hadn't been reprinted since, but, um, but it was for sale there. And I, pick, I, I bought that book and read it and just was profoundly moved by it. Okay? I was profoundly moved by it. And it, it shaped my understanding of uh, my role as, uh, as father and husband in the home to, uh, to set the tone, to set the tone of prayer. And um, sociological studies have confirmed this, the powerful influence of the Father in setting the example of prayer and worship in his home. Let me give you uh, cite a, just a couple of studies for you. The, um, the Swiss government did a study on uh, the transmission of religiosity uh, in the family back in the 2000s, and they published their results in, um, in the year 2000, as I recall. And in this study, they, uh, they examined um, the uh, religious practice of parents and then, um, then uh, did a long, longitudinal uh, study where they, they waited for years and then came back and uh, tracked uh, the religious practice of parents. And they found that, uh, you know, I could cite quite a bit of information, but I'll just cite two of the data points. Um, if the mother... In this, in this Swiss study, if the mother was a regular churchgoer, but the father did not attend church, there was only a 2% likelihood that the children would end up as regular churchgoers. On the other hand, if the father regularly attended church, but the mother did not attend at all, there was a 44% chance that the children would uh, grow up to become regular churchgoers uh, themselves. So it's just an an order of magnitude difference uh, on the religious example of the father. Again, let me cite another study. This one uh, was commissioned by the Southern Baptist Convention, which is uh, the largest American uh, religious denomination um, after uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, Of course, the Catholic Church is not a denomination, but we won't go into that. But Uh, Anyway, um, the Southern Baptists uh, commissioned a study on the effectiveness of family evangelism, and they found that if the first person in the family unit to convert uh, was the mother, there was a 17% chance that the entire family would end up entering uh, the Baptist uh, church. However, if the father in the home was the first convert, there was a 93% chance that the entire family unit would convert. And folks, I, I, I wit- can witness to this from personal experience, from uh, four years of doing urban evangelism in uh, the second largest city in Michigan. Um, after just a couple of years, uh, myself and my co-pastor realized that, um, that the key to doing evangelism in our community was getting the men involved. And that was, that was the demographic that was most ignored by other churches. Many churches would send in buses to pick up children for children programs midweek or to take them to church on Sunday. And there was also many outreaches for women. But there was no outreach to men in this very poor uh, urban blight community where uh, we were doing service. And as a result, while much ministry went on, the character of the culture never changed. Okay? It just perpetuated itself. And so after a couple of years in urban ministry, we began to focus all our efforts into attracting men uh, into the church, to doing outreach to men, and um, 
uh, in particular to trying to get men in the inner city community to marry their common law uh, wives, okay, and, uh, and bring their whole uh, families to church. And oftentimes when I was doing street evangelism, I'd go knock on a door, call on a family, I'd talk to a guy, and he would say, well, you know, I don't come to church, but, you know, I try real hard to make sure my kids get to church every week. And I would respond and say, you know what, you would be better off leaving your kids at home and coming yourself, okay? That long term would do much greater good for your children and for your whole family, okay? Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, and, uh, and we have this concept down. But we have to know these kind of statistics, we have to know this mentality, and we have to spread it, okay? And uh, what, what I'm saying is by no means intended to discourage moms uh, out here. We all know the example of St. Monica and many other great uh, mother saints uh, who prayed their family into the church. St. Monica is uh, the patron saint um, of my wife. Um, I don't know what that implies. <laughs> I to think about that. <laughs> it's like in case, in case John fails in his duties here. <laughs> He's got to have a backup plan. Um, but, um, so, uh, moms, uh, lay hold in great faith, uh, to the example of our blessed mother and St. Monica and others, and, uh, you too have a powerful influence on your children, uh, but statistically there is a strong correlation with the father, you know, and I was, I was, uh, uh asked to give a talk at a men's conference, um, uh, last year, and I, I prepared, you know, talking to, something similar to this, talking about the example of the patriarchs and setting the example of prayer in the home. And uh, so I went down to Florida. I was all energized, gave this talk. Um, I forgot that I was giving the talk in Florida uh, in late winter at a men's conference there. And uh, so at the end of the talk, I'm looking around, I'm like, am I the only guy here who still has some color in his hair? <laughs> and I get down off the podium, and I'm like, and talk didn't go over so well. One guy comes over, he's like, you know, could you have said something about grandfathers? Because <laughs> that's really what the demographic that I was talking about, talking to in late winter okay, in Florida. And as a matter of fact, I do have something to say about grandfathers because we got a powerful patriarchal example of how to lead in prayer as a grandfather with that forgotten patriarch known as Job. Okay, Job is kind of the odd man out of the patriarchs, but um, we you know think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in the book of Jacob, in the book of Job, it's clear that Job too lived at this time, and he also was a righteous man, although he was an Edomite, not in the uh, direct uh, covenant line. And in Job one five, we read about how Job um, used to uh, offer sacrifices for the purification. Of his grown children. He had grown sons and grown daughters uh, who used to feast together, um, have a, you know, apparently big sibling family reunions uh, with a lot of uh, eating and fun. And when, when those feasts were over, Job would uh, offer sacrifices in case that any of his grown children had sinned uh, during these uh, times of conviviality, and he would intercede to God on their behalf. And I think for grandfathers here, claim the example of Job. Your spiritual role is not over. See, your spiritual role is a metaphysical reality that is not dependent on time and space. It doesn't matter if your grown children are scattered around the country or even around the world. You still have a spiritual influence on them like ripples in a spiritual pond. And so uh, grandfathers claim the example of Job, offer prayer and sacrifice. Uh, you can do things like uh, attend Mass daily, offer the Mass uh, for your children and for your grandchildren, practice um, mortifications, uh, practice uh, fasting uh, and prayer and almsgiving on behalf of your family, and uh, you can have a powerful, powerful influence. So this is the first thing that we want to observe about um, the um, 
uh, the example of the patriarchs. They were fathers who prayed. And, and the survival of our Catholic faith is in a large part bound up with fathers who pray and pass that on to our children. That is one of the keys uh, to Catholic culture. And we need to create a culture of expectation. Um, boys need to grow up with this model in mind, with an idea that once I am married, okay, I am the one who gets up on a Sunday morning, gets the kids ready, uh, gets everybody into uh, the car, or preferably the van, and um, <laughs> because of openness to life, and, um, and gets everyone to church. Okay, let's move on to another uh, aspect of the uh, patriarchs uh, and their prayer. And that is the invocation of the presence of God by the name. The invocation of the presence of God by the name. It's a very, very interesting thing. We all know that the patriarchs prayed, but I, you know, I thought I'll do a word study. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll find all the instances in which, um, in which it talks about prayer or praying uh, in the book of Genesis. So I get out my uh, electronic uh, concordance and uh, I type in the Hebrew word for prayer. And uh, first of all, the word prayer in Hebrew never occurs in the book of Genesis. Is that surprising? It surprised me. Okay. And it's, it's rare even in the Pentateuch. And uh, the verb for praying only occurs in Genesis 20, where Abraham prays uh, for the foreign king to open the wombs of uh, his wives after the, um, the incident with um, uh, passing off uh, Sarah as his sister. Um, other than that, uh, the verb prayer does not occur in the book of Genesis. That's interesting, but now that doesn't mean, of course, that the patriarchs did not pray. What it means is that different terminology was used. And the, the preferred term for prayer... Uh, and in fact, worship generally in the book of Genesis is actually the phrase to call on the name of the Lord. Okay, to call on the name of the Lord. Such a beautiful expression. Um, we, we generally translate in English to call on the name of the Lord or call upon the name of the Lord, and that's because we're influenced by the rendering in the Septuagint. That's how the Septuagint rendered it, to call upon the name. But in the Hebrew, you could liter uh, legitimately translate it to cry out in the name. Okay? Because it's Bashem, in the name. To cry out in the name of the Lord, or to cry, or to call in the name of the Lord. Okay? As it were, immersed in the name of God. And we see this uh, in several places. The first time this is referred to, this crying out in the name of the Lord, is in, at the end of Genesis 4, when Seth was born, uh, uh, to, to Seth the son was born, called Enosh. And at that time, men became to, began to cry out in the name of the Lord. And that's significant where it occurs, because in Genesis 4, uh, Genesis 4 begins with the murder of Abel by Cain. It's the beginnings of the persecution of the righteous by the wicked. And then the rest of Genesis 4 details how Cain's line uh, began to develop human culture, but they developed it in a perverse way. And after six generations, you get this guy Lamech, okay, who is the inventor of bigamy, okay, that's why the, the, the Old Testament pejorativizes bigamy. That is to say, it implies that bigamy is a bad thing because um, the inventor of it is this very wicked man, the sixth generation from Cain, Lamech, who was a man of great violence and intimidation. And he, it, Genesis 4 relates how he called his two wives in Ada and Zillah, and he tries to intimidate his wives by, by relating how he's killed other men for insulting him. Okay, or just uh, for, for wounding him or, or striking him. You know, he, he uh, responds with aggressive vengeance. And, of course, that was meant to intimidate his wives and to keep him in line. So we see, we see uh, lust and violence in this figure of Lamech. And he's representative of his age. 
And so we see that the sin in the Garden of Eden by the end of Genesis 4, it has is metastasized, it's, it's grown out of control, and the world is becoming full of violence, uh, uh, particularly lust and, uh, and physical aggression. This, again, is going to be the problem in Genesis 6, right before the flood. Lust and violence are the sins that precipitate the flood, pun intended. Um, there's some of you awake there. <laughs> Nine o'clock in the morning, um, but uh, but in this situation, then be, men become to begin to cry out. It's the, the the cry of God's people under persecution. Okay, and this is part of God's pedagogy. Okay, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow persecution? Okay. Well, God does not change evil into good, but he does bring good out of evil. And one of the good things that God brings out of evil, and in particular the persecution of the righteous by the unrighteous, is to drive us into intimacy with God. Some of the greatest moments of intimacy with God are are the undergoing of persecution, the most intense prayer of Christ. Okay, the greatest prayer of Christ is John 17, just before he goes out to suffer his persecution. And then some of the most intense prayer is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and likewise uh, with St. Paul um, in, in times of his persecution. And likewise in our lives, some of the, the, the persecution of the world drives us into intense intimacy with God. It it drives us into understanding in a way that we would never otherwise understand our own human weakness, how our sins have estranged us from God, our need for God's power, the great difference between ourselves and God and our utter dependence on him. All these things um, are, are come upon us through persecution. And so you see that in the Bible how the, the beginnings of persecution and the growth of evil in Genesis 4 drives the people of God into intense prayer to call out in the name of the Lord. And as we go on in Genesis, we see, uh, we see the patriarchs doing this. Abraham, in Genesis 12, he builds an altar at Bethel. He calls on the name of the Lord there, and he returns there uh, many years later in Genesis 13. And in Genesis 21, he uh, creates a sanctuary in Beersheba by planting a tree there, probably a tree that was meant to be representative of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, trying to create kind of a new Eden, a new sanctuary uh, as a holy place to worship God. He calls upon the name of the Lord there. And uh, and Isaac does likewise. So they, they... Cry out in the name of the Lord, and this is the preferred way of prayer. Now, what does that mean in the Old Testament, to cry out in the name of the Lord? Well, as you know, in in the Old Testament, the name is something much more than just sounds that we use to refer to a person. Um, The name is sacred. The name is holy. The name represents the essence and the presence of the person. And one of the most, uh, there's a couple glorious chapters about this in the book of Exodus. One is chapter 3, the other is chapter 34. They're both involved revelations of the name of God to Moses. So in chapter 3, we all know this burning bush, right? Moses wants to know what God's name is. And God says to him, um, my name is I am who am. I am the, the, we would say in philosophical language, the one necessary being. Okay? The one whose essence and existence are the same, but we don't have to go into all that existence. But he is. He is the God who is. All the other gods are not. Okay? They are gods which don't exist. He is the one God that does exist. I am who am. Okay? So that's the name of God. But, but then that phrase, I am who am, that's not what's given to Moses to be used as the sounds coming out of the mouth to invoke God. It's actually um, the name uh, the Lord, you know, Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, yod Hey vav Hey, which is probably a, um, a, uh, an ancient Hebrew word meaning he is 
or some Jewish scholars suggest he causes to be, okay, uh, which is which I like very much that rendering. He causes to be, you know, a verb, okay. Um, so that is that is given to uh, Moses as God's name, but then it's very interesting in um, Exodus thirty-four. That's that famous passage where. Moses wants to see God, and God says, you can't see me. You can only see my back, so I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock with my hand. I'm going to pass by. You'll see my back, and as I pass by, I'm going to proclaim my name. Okay? What does it mean, proclaim your name, you know? Is that, you know, if if I were to proclaim my name, I would imagine, you know, walking down the street, John, 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 John. Okay? I'm proclaiming my name. All right? So... You, th- you think, you know, he's gonna, Moses is going to go in the cleft and the Lord's going to go by and go, the Lord, 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 the Lord. You know, he's going to proclaim his name. Maybe with trumpets, maybe with some musical background or something like that. Um, but that's not what happens in Exodus 34, you know. Uh, instead, what we get is an account of God's essence. So... So we read uh, in uh, verse 4, So Moses cut uh, two tables of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning, went out upon Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Okay, what's that mean? Well, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy and faithfulness. And that term mercy there is chesed, uh, which is actually specifically covenant fidelity. A God who is faithful to the covenant. Again, connecting the idea of the name of God with covenant fidelity and with prayer, as, as Dr. Hahn was doing last night. Keeping merciful love for thousands. Again, the word for uh, Hesed, um, covenant faithfulness, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, the children's children, to the third and fourth uh, generation. So a God of mercy and a God of justice, but primarily a God of mercy. God in his very essence is uh, merciful. Even his justice is an expression of his uh, mercy. So that is what it is to proclaim the name. It is wh- who God is, a, a description of who God is. So to cry out in the name of God, it's such a powerful concept. It means, it, it means in the presence of God, so to speak, immersed in God, um, in uh, e- evoking um, God's very being to surround you as you pray. And then uh, you know, in, in subsequent Judaism, there was the, the reverence for God's name grew. Um, before, the, uh, uh, before Solomon's temple was destroyed, uh, the people of Israel showed reverence for God's name by, by naming most of their sons with uh, part of God's name included. And that's why we have so many Yah names. You know, I, you know half the prophets are Yah, you know. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah. Okay, what's that all about? Well, that's that's the first syllable of God's name at the end, Yah. Okay, um, sometimes you know, it's spelled out like Yerem uh, Yahu uh, um, uh, would be the full the full form of um, uh, Jeremiah's name, but shortened usually to Yerem Yah. But, uh, but that's, that's the beginning of God's name at the end of uh, the prophet's name, the Lord. And so they showed reverence for God's name by naming themselves after God, okay? Which is a way of saying my essence only means something if it participates in the divine essence, okay? I exist depending on the one who exists, the one who causes to be, he who causes to be. A beautiful, beautiful thing. But then after the exile, when, they, when the Jews returned uh, to Jerusalem, um, after the Babylonian exile, they began to show the reverence for God's name by not pronouncing it. 
Okay, it was so holy, they, they feared to break the commandment against using God's name in vain, and so they did not pronounce the name of God. Instead, they would just say, the Lord, for the name of God. And that, of course, is the origin of our Catholic piety. Um, this is why we're not Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? We don't, uh, by the way, the, don't even get me started on, on the word Jehovah, okay, uh, which is a kind of a hybrid fusion of uh, linguistic mistakes uh, through time between uh, Hebrew and, and uh, English and things like that. So it's, uh, Jehovah is not the pronunciation of God's name. Um, but uh, but any of it, we're, we we don't we don't try to pronounce the ancient name uh, the ancient Hebrew name of God. We say the Lord Kurios, okay, Kyrie Eleison, and this is an ancient thing that we inherit from the old covenant people of God. This piety of not uh, pronouncing the holy name. It, it, and well, you know, how does that go? We'll get a little bit more into how this converts into Christianity, but there was one day of the year when the ancient uh, uh, Jews would allow the pronunciation of the name, and that was on the lips of the high priest on the Day of Atonement, okay? on the Day of Atonement, which is the highest and holiest day of the Jewish liturgical calendar. The high priest would go into the temple, he would make atonement for the sins of the people. When the whole liturgy was complete, he would come out to the uh, outer a porch of the temple, and the congregation of Israel would be gathered there for the liturgy, and there he would bless them with the priestly blessing of number six, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you, uh, etc. That priestly blessing, as you know, uh, uses the name of God three times, and then if you read in number six, uh, the Lord says to Moses, in this way they will put the name, they will put the name on the people. And so the high priest would come out, and three times he would put the name on the people. And there was such shock and awe as the Jews heard the name pronounced, which was never pronounced, that they would drop to the ground on their faces and lie prostrate when they would hear the sound of God. Once a year, boom, drop, okay, at the awesome name of God. That was the reverence that they had. Now, in the New Testament, this reverence for the name of God gets transferred to our Lord in his name, the holy name of Jesus. So in Matthew 121, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Jesus is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew name, the full form of which is Yehoshua, okay? Or shorter, Yeshua. We know it as Joshua in the Old Testament. Uh, but uh, the Lord saves. That's the full form of the name. And it gets shortened in its Greek form is Jesus. And so in the New Testament, uh, the name of Jesus uh, becomes the holy name. It is the holy name by which we cry out to God. And so we see that in John 16, 23. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father... He will give it to you in my name. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Okay? So this is the continuation of this ancient concept of crying out in the name of the Lord. Now Jesus, re- <coughs> Jesus identifies himself as the great I am in John 8. And then in John 16 he says, Now you need to cry out in my name. Cry out in the name of Jesus. And uh, you may say, well, you know, the obvious problem in this verse, and what everyone struggles with, this is, you know, I will give it to you in my name if you ask anything, okay? And the problem there is, you know, what about unanswered prayer, what we call unanswered prayer? How come, I, you know, I prayed for a Cadillac yesterday, okay? There was still a Plymouth Acclaim in front of my house <laughs> in the morning with most of its paint gone. Lord, what's going on here? Um, St. Augustine has a, has a great commentary on that. And I, I, uh, we're running short on time. Otherwise, I'd, I'd read the whole uh, uh, interpretation of St. Augustine on this passage. But St. Augustine, I think profoundly, does an, an analysis of what it means uh, to ask in the name. And he says, the name of Jesus is salvation. 
And to ask in the name means to ask in a way that's ordered to our salvation. Okay? Jesus' will for us is always our salvation. And so what we ask in his name will be granted if it contributes to our salvation. That's what St. Augustine says. And then he makes some other distinctions. He says, sometimes we ask too soon, and our request is not denied, it's just deferred until the time when it will contribute to our salvation. And then those requests that we ask in his name, which are not good for our salvation, will be denied by Jesus because he can only will our highest good. That's a profound, you know, I just I found it so beautiful. A profound reflection on the meaning of the holy name of Jesus and what it means to ask in his name, which means to ask in a way that is ordered to our salvation. So Jesus is uh, the holy name that's given to us now to cry out. And um, we see, remember how I told you that on the Day of Atonement, you know, we, and by the way, we see this in Sirach uh, chapter 50. We see the, the Jews prostrating themselves when Simon the high priest comes out to pronounce the name of the Lord with his lips on the Day of Atonement. But um, you know how they dropped and prostrated themselves. Well, this is the idea behind what St. Paul tells us in Philippians 2.9 about the name of our Lord. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. This is the divine name, okay? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in the heaven, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see what St. Paul is doing there? He's, he's shifting the piety that went with um, the Old Testament name of God now to uh, Yehoshua, uh, the Lord saves Jesus. Okay, um, And this is the origin of the pious practice that we've largely lost after the council of bowing the head at the holy name of Jesus. This is why we have a feast for his holy name. And you know, I'll, t- I'll tell a little anecdote here. When I, when I was a, a, just a Catholic for a year... I went to a conference um, of uh, theologians in, um, in Michigan. It was a good conference. Um, these were faithful theologians, but, you know, they were theologians. You know, doctorates and this, that, and the other. And so it was Hans Urs von Balthasar this, you know, and Andre de Lubac that, and St. Thomas X, Y, and Z. So all this stuff is going on, all these guys with, with uh, all these degrees behind their names and dignitaries of, of so on. And halfway through the conference, an elementary school teacher gets up. She raises her hand. The bishop, who's leading the discussion, calls on her. And she says, you know what? I notice nobody here bows their head at the name of Jesus. (laughs) And all the Hansers from Baltazar, this and that, they're all saying, ooh. Everybody's looking at their feet, you know. But, you know, I never, ever forget that. You know, St. Jose Maria said, you know, have, have, the, have the theology of theologians, but the piety of children. Okay? And he warned, don't have the piety of theologians and the theology of children. That's, that's St. Jose Maria said, you don't want that. Okay? Knowing already, you know, this has, you know, been a, a problem uh, for a long time. Um, but again, these are no aspersions on these men. But it's it's a matter um, it's a it's a matter of practice, and it's just we have lost that. We you know we've not been brought up to to bow the head. This is this has been lost in our culture. And even though uh, I love that, um, I'm not in the practice of it myself, uh, having been raised a Protestant, etc. But it would be wonderful if we could recover recover that uh, pious practice because it is rooted in our faith and in the Old Testament and in the reverence for the name. Okay, Uh, the catechism has a a beautiful reflection on the name of God. Uh, Let's look at this second quote because uh, we want to wrap up here. Uh, Catechism 2666. Look Look at what's said here. The one name that contains everything is the one that the Son of God received in his incarnation, Jesus. 
The divine name may not be spoken by human lips, but by assuming our humanity, the word of God hands it over to us and we can invoke it. Jesus, Yahweh saves. The name Jesus contains all, God and man, and the whole economy of creation and salvation. To pray Jesus is to invoke him and to call him within us. His name is the only one that contains the presence it signifies. See? Going back to the ancient Hebrew notion. Contains the presence it signifies. Jesus is the risen one. And whoever invokes the name of Jesus is welcoming the Son of God who loved him and who gave himself up for him. This is what the church teaches us on prayer, to cry out in the name of the Lord, and the Lord has been revealed to us in the face of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And finally, the patriarchs practiced perseverance in prayer. We see many examples of this um, uh, you know, we could talk about Abraham debating God with Je- in Genesis 18, where he, uh, he talks God down from 50 righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah down to 10. You know, Abraham was a very wealthy man. Um, I, I think this is, this is how he got his wealth. I mean, if you could talk the Almighty down from 50 to 10, I guarantee you Abraham was not paying full retail for his household goods, Okay. That man knew how to get a bargain. And that's, that's how he got all that herds and flocks and all that, all that stuff. He was a good, good businessman. So um, uh, Abraham, he's, but he debates with God. He, str- he struggles. He intercedes there. And, and, you know, and God winks at that. He's not, he's not criticized for that. And again, Jacob, you know... Uh, Jacob, in this uh, beautiful uh, chapter, Genesis 32, um, oh, I got to read some of this. It's, uh, it's, it's funny and touching at the same time. Okay, J- J- so Jacob's coming back from Padan Aram, and he's made his fortune abroad, and he's coming back, but now he's got to face his family. Remember what he did to his family? Remember what he did to his brother when he left 20 years ago? And now he's got to reconcile with folks in the hometown, right? So, So Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, men servants, and maidservants I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. Okay, sounds nice, all right? Messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We have come to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and 400 men with him. Oh. Now, why would they have left their women and children at home? Why would he be coming with 400 men folk? I wonder, I wonder what's, are we going to have a rumble? <laughs> Jacob knows what that means. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Yeah, darn right. He knows exactly what's, what it, what's good. You know, Esau's got 400 commandos. And we're, we're going to come and settle this score about that birthright and that pottage. Esau has not been happy since he ate those lentils. <laughs> and you know what? This, this leads to the only explicit prayer of Jacob um, in, uh, in, in Genesis. There, Jacob makes a vow. There is a vow at the beginning um, of his journey where he vows to the Lord that if the Lord will protect him, he will uh, worship the Lord. But here is a straight-out prayer, the only kind of straightforward, explicit prayer of Jacob. And it's beautiful. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercy and all the faithfulness which you have shown your servant. 
For with only my staff I crossed the Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I beg you, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and slay us all, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will do you good. And make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. He quotes one of the promises of the covenant. He says, I'm going to be wiped out, all my little kids, my wives. But you promised... You promise by a covenant, and you are the God of chesed. You are the God who keeps covenant. Now keep your promises to me. Beautiful. You know? And this is, this is what I was saying. Why does God allow evil? Why does God allow persecution? Why does he allow this hardship in our lives? It's to drive us into intimacy with the Almighty. Jacob is such a screwed up personality. He's proud. He's deceptive. All this stuff. Now comes this moment of truth. He's in fear of his life. And, and that, that persecution drives him to realize truths about himself and about God. It drives him to realize his unworthiness and his weakness. I'm not worthy of the least of your great. It finally humbles him. And from that posture of humility, then he can begin to truly pray. And sometimes this God is what God does in our, own, own, our, our lives as well. Uh, we shouldn't rebel against it. We should embrace it and allow the struggles of our life to teach us that humility, that total dependence on God that we see in Jacob's life. And then later we read the passage that's, that's there. Jacob was left alone during the night while Esau is on his way with his 400 commandos. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, of course, this is the angel of the Lord, probably the pre-incarnate Christ. That's my own theory, but that's speculative. Don't take that as church dogma. He touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint And as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you... I love it. I will not let you go unless you bless me. We need more Catholics who to grab on to the hem of Christ's garment and say, we won't let you go until you bless us. God loves people like that. You know? he, he winks at people that insist on getting in the covenant. Okay? Um, the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites, you remember the story of the Gibeonites in Joshua? They lie and connive their way into the covenant. And God smiles he has to turn his head away and laugh a little bit and then get serious again. But then, but then he finds a way to get the Gibeonites into the covenant. Jacob himself, he was so wants to be in the covenant, he, he'll try anything to do it. Okay? Now, God, is not, God doesn't endorse deception. He punishes Jacob for his deception. He punishes the Gibeonites for their deception. But what God likes is that desire to do anything to enter the covenant. I won't let you go, Jesus, until you bless me. Lay hold. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. You shall be called Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And that's uh, uh, Yisrael. It's from, from the Hebrew for strive. One who strives with God. And this is this is uh, Jacob receives a new name in prayer. And as the catechism says, this has always been understood as a great example of faith. Jacob wrestles all night with a mysterious figure. From this account, the spiritual tradition of the church has retained the symbol of prayer as a battle of faith and the triumph of perseverance. And, um, and there, that's why there's a whole section of the catechism about the battle of prayer. Isn't that uh, strange, you know? In the Middle Ages, you distinguished, you know, uh, men of steel or men with armor from men of the cloth, right? Because the clergy didn't fight and these other, you know, n but knights fought, okay? Uh, but um, but uh, here we got prayer, okay, being thought of as a battle. And there's a whole section of the catechism on this. I won't read the whole thing, but what do we pray, what do we battle against? Quick, four things that the catechism mentions. What do we battle against in prayer? We battle against distraction, Okay, uh, just stray thoughts, not being able to concentrate. For this reason, we should try to get to a quiet place. Um, we should have to try to have a prayer corner in the home uh, or go to a chapel or an Eucharistic adoration, make efforts to do these things where we can be quiet and attain that freedom from distraction. If we can't be free from distraction, um, 
just out of human weakness, uh, I always remember a, a teaching from St. Josemaria. He, uh, w- one time he was in prayer, and just out of human weakness, there was so much going on in his life, he was under so much pressure, he could not focus on the Lord. All he could make was interior acts of, of love. And he told the Lord, Lord, I'm like a hunting dog who's curled up on his master's feet, but all he can dream about is pheasants. Okay. <laughs> And that's the image. So, so St. Josemaria was like, I'm trying to curl up on your lap, Lord. I love you. I want to be in your presence. But I've got a dog mind, okay? I've just got this weak human mind, okay? And all these distractions, I, it's just weakness, okay? Just like dogs, have dog flesh weakness. We have human flesh weakness. We can't concentrate. But Lord, by curling up in your lap in your presence, um, I am... I am being with you. So do that. Even if you can't concentrate out of human weakness, curl up on the lap of the Lord or or, or be like a little child uh, and get up into the lap of your father and just be in his presence. We also fight against dryness super quickly. Um, People go through times of revival, times of charismatic revival. Uh, Big revivals have happened all through church history. Um, these revivals only have a lasting effect on the church if those who are involved in the, tr- in the revival learn to keep praying through times of dryness. Okay? Times of revival, when you get manifestations of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and healings and so on, that's the wet time. That's the rainy season where it comes down. Okay? Everybody will pray when it's easy to pray. Okay? Think about it. If you got ecstasy every time you prayed, would it be difficult to pray? Like, no, I'm going to go get a high, you know. This is great. You could get addicted to prayer, that, you know, with that. I'm just going to go get my daily high. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo, you know. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo, you know. Okay. That doesn't require any virtue to pray during those times because you get such consolations. In fact, you can, it can even be a selfish thing. It can be a kind of a, a spiritual addiction where you're, you're praying for the sensations that you receive rather than to be in communion with God. The test of your love for God is to continue to pray through times of dryness. And everybody has times of dryness. Okay? The next time a time of dryness comes to you, okay, look at it upon an opportunity like, oh, spiritual dryness, Whew, goody. I've been waiting for a time of dryness. Why have you been waiting for a time of dryness? Because it's an opportunity to actually demonstrate your love. Okay? Only those who love God continue to pray through dryness. This is the, this is the test if you're the, the good soil seed or the shallow soil. Okay? So look forward to times of dryness, and your prayers are particularly efficacious during these times. Your, pr- your prayers are particularly meritorious during times of dryness because you're doing it without consolation. You're not getting anything out of it, so it's a pure sacrifice, a pure act of love for God. It's a very pure form of prayer. Great opportunity uh, to show your love. So sit, your love for God. So keep up the same times um, of prayer. When you're going through dryness, uh, make your half hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Push through it and, and know that you're, that you're making a, a pure expression of love for God during those times. Lack of faith, uh, this can express itself in so many ways. We just don't think that prayer actually does anything because we're so materialistic. We just look at things from a visible perspective. We've got to get, get out of that mode of thinking in terms of just material reality. And another uh, it, uh, uh, impediment to prayer is acedia or lukewarmness. And this is, the, this is the gradual loss of fervor by, which begins by not paying attention to little things, okay? Letting go of our little practices of prayer, you know, those little aspirations to our lady when we see her image, um, the, the uttering a prayer when we pass a church or the tabernacle, Um, cutting down on the time that we set aside for Eucharistic adoration or rushing through the rosary. Asadia starts small and then it grows into lukewarmness and uh, it becomes a kind of spiritual sloth. And we have to battle against that by staying ever vigilant and uh, being uh, being faithful in those small acts of prayer um, and uh, those small acts of piety that protect us um, from having to do battle in bigger areas of our life. So let's follow the uh, pattern of the patriarchs, uh, fathers. Let's set that example in the home. 
grandfathers as well. Let's pray in the presence of God's name. Let's persevere. Amen.